Hello everyone. So as a part of the INICT revision series, the today's topic for revision is the electrolyte and metabolic disturbances. So I'll be discussing the electrolyte emergencies and how do you diagnose them and how do you treat them. So I have given you five clinical scenarios, right? So in the clinical scenario which has been given to you, you should be able to identify which electrolyte abnormality is associated with the clinical scenario which has been given to you. Now let us start with the first clinical scenario. So the first clinical scenario is a 40 year old woman treated with spironolactone and lisinopril for heart failure. Presence with bradycardia and ECG shows tall tented T wave. So which electrolyte abnormality like is it suggestive of is the clinical question. So among the options which has been given to you are hyperkalemia, hypomagnesemia, hyperlipidemia, zinc deficiency, hypomagnesemia, hypernatremia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, selenium deficiency, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. So the individual is on the spironolactone which is a potassium sparing diuretic and lisinopril that is ACE inhibitor and the ECG is showing tall tented T waves. So this is suggestive of your hyperkalemia. Now you need to be very much aware of what are the drugs which will precipitate hyperkalemia. Please remember whenever you give a combination of the ACE inhibitors and potassium sparing diuretics that will precipitate the development of hyperkalemia. But this combination, it is not completely contraindicated. This combination is very much useful in the treatment of the severe heart failure. And that is being proved by the Rolls trial. So when you give this combination of spironolactone and as well as ACE inhibitor, there was improvement in the survival in patients with the heart failure. And that is being proved by the Rolls trial. So potassium sparing diuretics, they include spironolactone and the other one is the eplerinone and the ACE inhibitors and as well as the ARBs. These two drugs never you should combine. Okay, so when you combine both of these drugs, there is high chances of development of the hyperkalemia. So these two drugs you should never combine. Now, what are the ECG changes that you will come across in patients with the hyperkalemia? The earliest sign of the hyperkalemia will be tall tented T wave. So presence of tall T wave, the differential diagnosis, right? The differential diagnosis will be early stages of the myocardial infarction. Now, but in case of MI, you will have broad tall T wave, whereas in hyperkalemia, it is tall tented T wave. Okay. Then followed by that, what are the other ECG changes in hyperkalemia? So as the potassium increases the P wave, it becomes wide and flattened. And what will happen to the PR segment, right? So before the disappearance of the P wave, if you take the PR segment, the PR segment, it lengthens. And eventually at one point of time, the P wave completely disappears. But when the potassium levels increases more than seven milli equivalents per liter, what is that you will observe is you will observe wide or prolonged QRS interval. There will be a bizarre or abnormal QRS morphology. That is what you will observe when the potassium levels are more than 7 milli equivalents per liter. And there can be also development of bradycardia as well. And at the potassium levels of more than 9 milli equivalents per liter, at that point of time, the individual will develop cardiac arrest. So this will be the ECG changes depending upon the CVRT of the hyperkalemia. Now, what is the treatment for hyperkalemia? The first line drug for hyperkalemia is the calcium gluconate. Now this calcium gluconate, it will not reduce the potassium levels. It will sensitize the myocardial membrane against the development of the arrhythmias. And what are the drugs that will reduce the potassium? You should give insulin plus dextrose. The other drugs are salbutamol nebulization then the other drugs like what we have is furosemide which is a loop diuretic and then 
सोडियम पॉलीस्टाइरीन सल्फोनेट विच इज ए पोटेशियम बाइंडर सोडियम पॉलीस्टाइरीन सल्फोनेट एंड इन रिफ्रैक्टरी केसेस वी डू डायलिसिस सो दैट वॉज द फर्स्ट क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो वेर द क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो वॉज सजेस्टिव ऑफ द हाइपर क्लिनिया एंड यू टेक द सेकेंड क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो ए थर्टी ईयर ओल्ड मैन प्रेजेंट्स वुमेन प्रेजेंट्स विद टिटेनी पेरियोरल पेरेस्थीजिया एंड कार्पोपीडल स्पैजम आफ्टर द थाइरॉइड सर्जरी सो इन विच इलेक्ट्रोलाइट अबनॉर्मैलिटी यू विल हैव दिस क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो यू विल हैव दिस क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो इन पेशेंट्स विद द हाइपो कैल्सीमिया सो दैट इज द ऑप्शन एच दैट इज हाइपो कैल्सीमिया नाउ वॉट आर द कॉजेस फॉर अक्यूट हाइपो कैल्सीमिया और वॉट आर द कॉजेस फॉर अक्यूट हाइपो पैराथाइरोडिज्म दैट इज थाइरॉइड सर्जरी वेन यू डू थाइरॉइड सर्जरी देर इज हाई चांस दैट देर कैन बी ऑल्सो पैराथाइरॉइड एक्टमी सो वन देर इज पैराथाइरॉइड एक्टमी दैट विल कॉज द हाइपो कैल्सीमिया सो द क्लिनिकल फीचर्स ऑफ हाइपो कैल्सीमिया इज दैट there will be tetany perioral paresthesia and as well as carpopedal spasms and we have a clinical entity called as the latent tetany so in case of latent tetany you have two important signs one is the chostic sign and the other one is the trosier sign so these two you will come across in the latent tetany okay so now in chostic sign like you tap the facial nerve at the angle of mandible you will observe the spasm of the muscles on that half of the face whereas in trosier sign you apply the bp cuff and you increase the pressure in the bp cuff and maintain it above the systolic blood pressure right and once you maintain it above systolic blood pressure for 1 to 2 minutes there will be development of the carpopedal spasm that is called trosier sign so these two signs you will come across in latent tetany and what are the ecg changes that you will have in case of the hypocalcemia in hypocalcemia you will have long qt interval whereas in hypercalcemia you will have short qt interval so these are the ecg changes that you will have related to disorders of the calcium then what is the treatment of acute hypoparathyroidism you need to give intravenous calcium gluconate that will be the drug of choice in case of acute hypoparathyroidism now you take the another third clinical scenario third clinical scenario a 30 year old man being treated for a systemic fungal infection presents with muscle weakness erythemias and ecg shows prolonged pr interval and prominent u waves so if you take the ecg that will give you uh, the clinical diagnosis or which electrolyte abnormality is that that is suggest you of your hypokalemia but what you have to understand is the fungal infection the anti fungal drug that we give is the amphotericin b and this amphotericin b is associated with the hypokalemia right so amphotericin b treatment will cause the potassium loss and that will result in the hypokalemia and what are the other ecg changes that you will have in patients with the hypokalemia so in hypokalemia the ecg changes are first and foremost the earliest ecg change will be the prominent u wave then the t wave it becomes flat and at one point of time it is inverted and then followed by that there will be st segment depression there will be prolonged pr interval and there will be peaked p wave and this peaked p wave is what is called as the p pulmonary right this peaked p wave is what is called as the p pulmonary so this will be the ecg changes that you will have in patients with the hypokalemia but the p pulmonary here we call it as pseudo p pulmonary the true p pulmonary you will have that in tricuspid stenosis causing right atrial hypertrophy whereas in hypokalemia what you will have is pseudo p pulmonary and what is the treatment for hypokalemia you need to give intravenous kcl supplementation depending upon the cvrt of the hypokalemia but you should be very much aware of this ecg changes that is prominent u wave inverted or flat t wave st segment depression then prolonged pr interval and pseudo p pulmonary then you take the another clinical scenario of the electrolyte abnormality the clinical uh, scenario is a 50 year old women on total parenteral nutrition presents with red crusted lesions around the nostrils and as well as the corners of the mouth 
which electrolyte abnormality is associated with prolonged total parental nutrition so with prolonged parental nutrition the individual can predispose to the development of the zinc deficiency and thereby in zinc deficiency you get red crusted lesions so these are the red crusted lesions that you will see surrounding the nostrils and as well as the corners of the mouth and what are the other features of the zinc deficiency zinc deficiency may cause hair loss lowered immunity reduced production of sex hormones in males causing impotency diarrhea eye and skin sores loss of appetite slow growth in infants and children and impotency so these are all the manifestations of the zinc deficiency and prolonged parental nutrition is at risk of developing zinc deficiency where the individual can have crusted lesions around the mouth and nostrils now the last clinical scenario a 45 year old woman presents with thirst abdominal pain and history of the renal stones so abdominal pain renal stones and as well as thirst so all that you will come across in clinical scenario of the hypercalcemia and if you take the etiology of hypercalcemia there are numerous etiologies causing the hypercalcemia and these etiologies include the malignancy so what is that malignancy causing the hypercalcemia is adenocarcinoma of the kidney can cause hypercalcemia by causing tertiary hyperparathyroidism or ectopic parathormone secretion and then squamous cell carcinoma of the lung is also the source for parathormone secretion which can cause hypercalcemia and primary hyperparathyroidism the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism is solitary parathyroid adenoma and then sarcoidosis non caseating granuloma of sarcoid tissue will be producing the calcium and then thyrotoxicosis so these are the causes of hypercalcemia and what is the initial management in patients with the hypercalcemia you need to give iv fluids and you need to dilute the calcium because hypercalcemia when the calcium level goes more than 14 mg per deciliter actually the calcium levels are 9 to 11 if the calcium levels are more than 14 mg per deciliter the individual can have systolic arrest so you need to dilute the calcium and flush out the calcium so for which you need to rehydrate the individual with iv fluids and for the treatment it completely depends upon what is the underlying cause for hyperparathyroidism for suppose if the hypercalcemia is due to malignancy then you need to give bisphosphonate therapy and the bisphosphonates like what we have is zolindronic acid ibandronate and then alendronate so these are the bisphosphonates what is the mechanism of action of bisphosphonates they inhibit the osteoclast resorption of the bone and thereby they will lower the serum calcium levels so this is how you have to treat the hypercalcemia so in the today's inct revision series like what we have discussed is we have discussed the electrolyte abnormalities so the first electrolyte abnormality is suggestive of the hyperkalemia and second electrolyte abnormality it is suggestive of the hypocalcemia third electrolyte abnormality is suggestive of the hypokalemia and fourth electrolyte abnormality it is zinc deficiency and fifth electrolyte abnormality is associated with hypercalcemia so for more updates you follow my channel that is raj gubba or uh, raj ramya wherein you will get daily updates Thank you very much and see you tomorrow.